Hi, I'm Scott Harden, and on the screen you're looking at my electrocardiogram, or my ECG. And this is a live recording of the electrical signals being produced by my heart. And as I move around and handle the circuit, uh, you can see that sometimes noise gets in the signal, but that's extra proof that this is a real live signal. I can unplug it and plug it back in, and the vertical autoscaling takes a minute to uh, do its thing. But this is a live signal looking at the electro electrical potential of my heart. Uh, it's accomplished by chest electrodes, which are actually muscle stimulator pads. So these normally are stuck on someone and the current goes through them to cause muscle twitching. Uh, but I use these pads because they're a convenient way to get an electrode to record electrical signals. They don't have to worry about taping onto my body. They're just adhesive and they stick. And I actually have an extra one here. They come on these little clear plates and you can sort of stick it to anything. Um, so I'm using two electrodes, one on my chest and one on my side. And I have a third one that's really just a ground electrode uh, on my right leg. And the output of those electrodes is being fed into this circuit here. And this is what I think is really interesting about this project. This is a surprisingly good ECG being produced by a really simple circuit. This is a single microchip an LM741 operational amplifier. And this is probably a microchip that you already have in your junk box. A single microchip and five resistors is all it takes to make an ECG that looks this good. Uh, and also it's being powered by a nine volt battery. The output of this operational amplifier goes into this headphone cord, which gets plugged into the input of my sound card. So it looks like a microphone to the computer. And then, here is the other interesting part of this project, is I wrote some software in Python that does some math to the input signal to clean it up and make it really easy to see. Uh, before I go any farther, I want to address the people who are probably screaming at me through the screen. They're saying, Scott, if you're going to work with small signals or analog, why are you doing this on a breadboard? And there's a lot of validity to that concern. If you're doing anything involving analog circuitry, and especially amplification of small signals, you're not going to want to design a, design a device like this on a breadboard. And that's true. And the reason is because there is a lot of noise which can be picked up by a breadboard. Uh, this works by a bunch of horizontal metal rails here, which incidentally act like little radio antennas, and they pick up electromagnetic radiation. And the most prominent source of radiation in this room are electrical signals being emitted from the wires in the wall. Here in America, we have 60 hertz alternating current, so these horizontal rails act as little antennas, and they inject 60 hertz electrical signals into our input. And as a result, it amplifies a whole lot of 60 hertz signals that we're not interested in. So let's glance at the software, and if I adjust the software to low-pass filter at zero hertz, we can see the actual data coming into the computer. And I'll stop handling the breadboard so it uh, starts to get a little bit cleaner. And if you look, if you look really closely, you can see my heartbeat in there. Um, my heartbeat is sort of where it goes up and down a little bit. But my heartbeat is mixed in with a lot of noise, a lot of 60 hertz noise. And there are a couple ways that we could eliminate it. The most obvious way is to improve my construction techniques. Um, but that wouldn't get rid of all of it. The next step would be to improve the circuit. There's a lot of work that we could do with multiple operational amplifiers or something called an instrumentation amplifier that would dramatically improve the quality of the signal coming out of this device. But I decided to take an opposite approach. Just as a personal challenge, I wanted to see how simple I could keep this circuit and have a really good ECG waveform on the output. So rather than improve the circuit with expensive or rare components or very carefully matched components, I made this kind of foolproof. You can probably use almost any components as long as you have a general amplification scheme. Uh, the magic is done in software. So I take the signal that you see here, and I convert it to the frequency domain with, with a function called FFT. And then I eliminate the high frequency components and convert it back to the time domain. And when I do that, I can adjust a cutoff frequency or a low pass frequency. So if I make it 70 hertz, then it allows everything under 70 hertz. So we can see the ECG, but also a lot of that 60 hertz noise. And just to show you a little bit more clearly, I'm going to pause this signal and I'm going to zoom in on it. So you can see these really are more or less 60 hertz sine waves mix in with the ECG. Uh, so I'll take pause off, and now I'm going to low pass filter it to about 45. Uh, now most of our 60 hertz noise has been eliminated, and the ECG comes through. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and take a picture here. So I'll call it Scott's video 
demonstration and save figure and I can stick that up on my website. Um, I'll talk in a little bit more detail in a few minutes about exactly how this works but I thought this is pretty cool. Again, there's nothing new about an electrocardiogram and it's even a do-it-yourself electrocardiogram. The thing that I think is so interesting about this project is how simple of a circuit we can build to produce such fantastic output. Now I'm going to take a minute just to talk about the software. Uh, since this is the first time I've shown the software to anyone, I just want to introduce it pretty quick. Um, first of all, the chest leads which go in here could be reversed. So I'm just going to go ahead and reverse them on the breadboard. And when I say that they could be reversed, I mean that I don't specify put this chest lead here, put this chest lead there. And the result, if you reverse the chest leads, I could have done the same thing by unsticking them and switching them, is that your ECG will look upside down. So I added a button that says invert, and it does exactly what you would expect it to do. If you invert it, it swaps the orientation. Um, auto scale makes pretty good sense. If you leave it unchecked, then it doesn't automatically change the vertical axis, even if noise comes through or something like that. Low pass, we've already looked at. Um, the title makes sense. And if we pause it, you can sort of zoom in to any part of the signal. Uh, I will mention that I'm doing this with the QT4 window libraries, and I'm using PyQT4 graph, um, or QT graph, or something like that, to do the graphing. And I toyed with the idea of distributing this as an EXE program for Windows users, but I really want to keep it stuck to just distributing the Python source. And the reason why is because here's an EXE which I made, and I used the Py installer program to generate it, and it takes a really long time to load. It's because this EXE is huge. It's almost 160 megabytes. And it's so large because it packs the entire Python interpreter with it. So it's not just a 4 kilobyte Python script like the actual Python script is. It's the 4 kilobyte Python script plus the Python distribution plus all of the libraries I'm using. PyQt4, NumPy, SciPy. There are a couple doozies in there that end up making it hundreds of megabytes. So it's not really convenient for me to distribute the executable. Um, I haven't decided whether or not I'm even going to make it available, but if nothing else, the Python script should work for everyone. And um, anyone who's using Linux can probably figure out how to use how to get the Python script to work on their own. But I did want to take just a second to make sure that anyone who wants to run it can figure out how. So here is where I have installed WinPython. In WinPython you can just Google WinPython. Figure out how to download the 64 or 32-bit version, whatever matches your computer. But I developed this specifically to work with an out-of-the-box distribution of WinPython. 3.2.0, no, I'm sorry, 3.5.2.1. And it would probably work with any WinPython version 3, but I've tested it with Python, WinPython 3.5.2.1, and if you run it, uh, it should run right, right away. So I'm going to demonstrate that by showing you here. So this is the project that you get straight from the GitHub. If I go to the software folder, this program is go. .py. And if you just double click it, it will be run with whatever Python is set in your path, in your system path. Uh, we don't necessarily want to do that. On the other hand, if you open up your WinPython distribution, the actual python.exe lives here. So, let's see, there's the python.exe. So if we point this path, backslash python.exe, that's where we're going to want to run this program from. So we can edit this batch file here. I'm using two displays and only one of them is being captured by the, uh, by the screen. All we have to do is make sure that that path matches in the batch file. And that's all that you have to do. And I'll hit save. So if we double click go, it popped up on my other screen, but it just starts right away. So anyone who's never used Python before, um, I'd recommend giving it a shot. Don't be too afraid. You saw how easy that was. Uh, I would recommend not running this from inside of an interpreter like IPython or, um, or Spider or some other thing that gives a bunch of rich features. These GUIs tend to crash at sometimes, so just make sure you run it straight from the command line and it should run okay. Um, one more thing I'll mention is that this software is designed to be run from your default microphone. So I know you can't see what I'm doing, but if I look at my recording devices, you're probably used to seeing this screen here. 
if you look at my recording devices, I can have more than one microphone. But whatever I set to my default, that's what's going to be used. So if I hook up a wrong microphone, I'll just show you what happens. I'm going to set my audio microphone, the one that you can hear me on, I'm going to set that to the default. And then I'll run the software. Okay, and this is what happens when I'm running on the wrong software. And I'll turn it to zero hertz. So now you can actually see this is my voice and it's being plotted in real time and that's clearly a problem. Um, I've got to close the software, set the correct microphone, and this microphone that I'm setting is the one that my circuit is attached to, and then when I double click go, this is what pops up. And that's what we need to do. So I think that's going to be enough to get anyone started who actually wants to build it. I've gotten a lot of emails uh, over the last several years of people who have tried to recreate my ECG machine, uh, one that I posted on the internet a long time ago and this seems to be a big struggle. So I hope that with the software, I might have eliminated some of that for Windows users. Let's take a minute to talk about how this circuit works. And I have the schematic shown here, but this schematic's a little bit hard to read because it's all clustered together. And I put everything close together so it would fit easier in a JPEG. Uh, but to run through it briefly, I'll use a dry erase board that makes it a little bit easier to understand. So the core of the circuit is an operational amplifier. An operational amplifier is shown like this with a non-inverting and an inverting input. And usually you have an in and an out. And one of the most common uses for an operational amplifier is signal amplification. So to make a small input, a larger output. And one of the configurations that does this uses a voltage divider like this with respect to ground. And the values I've chosen are 100k and 1.8k. And the reason I've chosen those values is because the ratio between the two is about 50. So that gives me about a 50 times gain from the input and the output. Um, this kind of obviously goes to the computer. And I will take a moment to note that it's with respect to ground. So the microphone input of my computer with respect to ground is what the output of this device is. Um, I can start introducing my electrodes. So this is the leg electrode, and I ground my leg. So this is equivocal to using a wrist strap when you're grounding yourself or something like that. I'm just grounding my leg instead of my arm. It's farther away from my heart, and it does a better job of not quelching the signals from my, from my heart. Um, the signal being amplified is this, and I can draw a lead here and I'll call it chest one. So if you were to build this device, oh yeah, I've got to add power. So it's being powered from a battery. So I'll call it plus and minus right there. And actually I'll take a note right now. Power this device from a battery. Use a nine volt battery. Do not use a bench power supply. We'll talk a little bit more about safety in a minute. Um, but it's just really important that you do this from a battery. Partially because we need the ability to swing our power supply voltage. We need the ability to float our battery at a, at a voltage range. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if I were to build this circuit, it would actually work. All I would need is my leg and my chest and two, two resistors, and it would output an ECG. And I actually have a design like this on my website from several years ago. That works, and it doesn't work very well. <laughs> you can see the ECG, but that's about it. The fact that it works at all is kind of a hack. Um, but this is all that you need to have a basic amplifier. But this wouldn't give me the quality of signals that I want. I mean, if you see on the screen, this looks really good. Uh, so the way that I generated that was I detached this from ground. So I'm going to remove the ground right there. And we'll revisit that later. Um, and shoot, actually, now's a good time to talk about it. I replaced that ground with another lead, chest 2. And instead of grounding that directly, I'm sort of indirectly ground. Because I ground my leg, and I'm connected to my leg, hopefully. I haven't messed up that bad. Uh, I'm connected to my leg, so my chest is ground. So this lets me have a, have a pretty good ground situation. Um, although there's a problem. Technically, this should work, but this would only work if your voltage is, your ambient voltage is sort of perfectly in the range where this can amplify it. This doesn't do a good job at amplifying signals as it approaches the plus or the minus rail of the amplifier. 
the amplification is so large that it can only amplify signals in a very narrow range of voltages, essentially the midpoint between the plus and the minus. So we're going to add a little bit of circuitry to pull the voltage of our body to the halfway point between the plus and minus. And when I say that, that's not actually what it's doing. It's not changing the voltage of my body with respect to the battery. It's sort of floating the battery to match the voltage of my body because I'm grounded. So let's talk about that again. Um, there's the plus terminal of the battery. Here is a voltage divider and the minus terminal of the battery. I think I used 1.8K resistors for both. And then I'll add a ground symbol here. So just by doing this, I, play, I move the voltage of the battery. So instead of being 0 volts and 9 volts, it's negative 4.5 volts and plus 4.5 volts because it's centered at ground. So now we're halfway there. We have our body about where we want it to be. And actually, no, we don't have our body where we want it to be. We have this voltage where we want our body to be. And the way that I connect it to my body is through a very high value resistor. This is a 10 mega ohm resistor. And there are a couple reasons I want this to be a high value. Although it would make sense you, you wouldn't want to connect yourself directly to a power source through a low value resistor. That's not the, why, that's not the reason why. The reason why is if you had a straight connection to this chest lead, you would just make your chest lead this voltage and your chest lead wouldn't be free to oscillate uh, with your heart. So by connecting it with a 10 mega ohm resistor, it keeps your chest approximately in the right region, halfway between the plus and minus, so that the amplifier can amplify it, but it doesn't lock it down too much. So I think this is actually the whole circuit. We're done here. Um, and just kind of keep in mind, in your imaginary mind, that this halfway point between the plus and minus is ground, which is the leg. So your leg point is this point, and um, everything is kind of kept near ground with this circuit here, and the battery is centered, the voltage of the battery plus or minus is centered so the ground is the halfway point. So now with one operational amplifier, an LM741, and one, two, three, four, five resistors, I have a surprisingly good ECG on the output. So let's take a moment and talk about the safety of this. Anytime we build a circuit, that you connect to your body, you always have to take a little bit of time to really consider what you're actually doing and make sure you don't do anything potentially dangerous. I think it goes without saying that you shouldn't be connecting yourself to a bench power supply. I feel a lot more comfortable doing this with a floating battery and especially a 9 volt battery. Um, but with all that being said, 9 volt batteries even in themselves can be really dangerous. A stun gun runs on a 9 volt battery. So just because it's a 9 volt battery doesn't mean it's safe. Uh, let's take a little closer look at this and contemplate our safety. And again, I'm not saying that this is a safe device. Don't wear it all day. Don't go to sleep in it. Don't put it on other people. If you're going to build it, you have to build it at your own risk and pay close attention to what you're doing. Um, however, when thinking about this from a safety perspective, we consider what we're attached to. This device attaches to us in three locations. Um, the first one is the leg for grounding ourselves. That's generally okay. You think about what a grounding strap does if you put it on your wrist. I feel comfortable being grounded. The time when grounding is a concern is when you're also dealing with some high voltage or high current possibilities um, with respect to ground, which we're not, we're not really doing here, especially because we're using a battery with respect to ground, and um, there's just not a whole lot of voltage or current that's going to be generated in this configuration. Another thing to consider is what you're actually connected through. So this case is probably the simpler one. This chest lead is connected to the battery through a 10 mega ohm resistor, which is an incredibly high resistance. So this is not going to be capable of doing very much. And it's also connected to the operational amplifier, but it's connected to the input. This is a high impedance input. So this is really close to floating in all directions. It's going to be very hard for anything nasty to come out of this chest lead. A slightly more concerning one would be this chest lead, uh, because this does experience, potentially, some of the output current that, be, that could be coming through here, or that could be coming from the computer, uh, coming in through the microphone cable. Um, but again, kind of for the same reason, I feel, personally I feel safe with this configuration because we're going into the high impedance inverting input. Probably the most scary thing is that we are connecting through 
a, you know, over 100K of resistance to the output of an operational amplifier. But again, that's with respect to what? With respect to this negative and positive voltage, which we aren't really clamped to anyway. So all in all, I'm not particularly concerned about this circuit. Uh, it's very easy when we talk about the safety of an ECG machine like this. A lot of people can come out and say, oh my gosh, this is dangerous, and this is why, this, this, and this. And it was actually really interesting. In the past when I posted similar projects, I get a lot of feedback, kind of, you know, in, in both directions. Some people say that it's meaningless, small voltages and currents, and, and are sort of proposing that it's extremely safe. And some people that are truly <laughs> concerned about dying because they point out the fact, which is true, that milliamps of current can kill, especially if they're oscillated in a, in a certain way. Um, and, this, and I've also heard some people equate it to uh, putting headphones in their ear and say they're getting about the same amount of electrical current from that. Uh, so all in all, I feel comfortable with this design, but if you have any specific input about the safety of this design, I would love to hear about it. Go ahead and write it up in an email and send it to me, and I'll post it on my website. So I definitely would appreciate your input. Um, but again, don't build it if you're not comfortable with it, and I don't think in any case you should hook it up to yourself. I'll probably play it safe and say that all of this information is for educational purposes only, and none of this is actually intended to be built to everyone, and I'm advising you and everyone not to connect it to yourself. But I would appreciate hearing from you if you have any feedback on how safe you think this really is. Thanks. A couple notes on the electrodes that I'm using. I am using these muscle simulators, and I got these from Amazon.com. Um, they hooked to some commercial equipment, and they also have these really convenient little cords. So on one end, it's a connector that goes into the stimulator, and on the other hand, it's kind of a headphone connector. So it makes it easy for me to connect to my um, electrical devices because I have those headphone connectors on hand. Um, so these aren't, I don't remember the exact price, but I have a link to these on my website. And all electrodes like this work by making electrical contact with your body. And a lot of times, just surface-to-surface -surface contact isn't enough. It helps if you have some type of gel in the middle that permits the passage of ions. And liquids or gels that are rich in ions, like sodium and chloride are per permit the passage of electricity. And I don't want to go crazy, but if you, if you taste these, they taste salty. Uh, and that's why. They have a little bit of gel on them that probably are uh, chloride-rich gel. Um, another type of electrode that I used to use, I still have a bunch of them left over, are these. They're Nyko tabs, and I got them on e eBay a really long time ago, but I have just a huge number of these. Um, they peel off like this, and they are very adhesive, but they only actually stick for a few minutes. I wouldn't want to use them for a long period of time. The muscle stimulators that I'm using stay on all day. These only stay on for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and they don't do a good job if I move around too much. They're really sticky, but only for the first, first time. Um, but they are electrically conductive right here, so I can gator clip onto them if I want to get the electrical signals. Uh, I'll probably post some pictures of all these being used on my website, but I'm not going to do it for the YouTube video. So that's another option. If you don't have any of these on hand, you can actually make some of your own electrodes. And I've done that here. These are three pennies. And the pennies have been soldered to the wire. And I can attach this wire right into the breadboard. So instead of my three electrodes that I'm using now, I can use these three pennies. And since I don't have you know, this chloride paste, I can do something pretty good. And that's adding a drop of conditioner, like hair conditioner, um, sometimes moisturizer, pretty much anything that is a commercial gel. Usually has some ions in there, some electrolytes, that can permit the passage of current. So it does okay if I just tape the pennies right to my chest. I can do them <laughs> sort of like this. Um, and they do okay, but they definitely do better if I add a little bit of hair conditioner. So even if you don't have professional electrodes, you can make something like this, and it only costs three cents. Let's talk about the software real quick. Um, the software on the screen does kind of an interesting thing that I haven't seen any other software do. And the way that it works is, and I, I'm going to try to describe it in words that you can understand if you read the code. It's only maybe a page of code. It's not that complicated. Um, but it reads a very small amount of PCM audio data. So I'll just call that PCM. I'll make the line a little bit bigger. 
So it reads a little bit of a chunk, and I think that's actually called chunk. So the chunk size is maybe a thousand samples or something like that. It's not very big. But it keeps adding chunks one by one. And it uses a threaded module. So whatever the regular Python program is doing, recording just kind of happens automatically, and it doesn't get held up. So you can have other code running at the same time. So it keeps adding chunks. And when it gets to the max length, I think it might be called max size, something like that. When it gets to the max size, draw an arrow here. So a chunk is one piece, the max size is. When it gets to the max size, then for every chunk it adds, it removes the old one. So this way, there's always the same amount of memory in this memory buffer. And that's kind of the, the fundamental basis of how it works. So no matter when you ask for it, I call it data, I think, the data variable always has about five seconds of audio. So I'll draw that just kind of like this. So it has five seconds of audio. So when my software is graphing it, it requests this audio. And before turning it, before doing the frequency math on it, uh, it does something kind of special to it that causes it to be pinched on the edges. And if you look really closely at the at the ECG that's being recorded right now, you can see that the, especially if I make noise, you can see it a little bit better. Um, the signal sort of gets magnified for the first quarter of a second, and then it stays full size, and then it gets pinched in, pinched off at the end. Uh, the way I do that is I make function like this, and it's actually nonlinear, but I essentially multiply this by this, and this goes from 0 to 1. So then the signal that I do math on looks like this, where the edges are pinched a little bit. And that makes it a little bit easier for the software to get really clear data after we do the inverse FFT, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I guess from this point, this is still PCM data, I then generate an FFT. So I take this amount of data and I convert it to the frequency domain. So instead of being time versus, I don't know, we'll call it amplitude, time, amplitude. The FFT is this thing where it kind of, we'll call it like that, with a peak at 60 hertz, 120, et cetera. This is the frequency with respect to power. And this is <laughs> starting to get messy. But then I, to low pass filter it, I just set everything above a certain value to zero. So I just chop off all that. Then I take the inverse FFT, so I FFT, and that turns it back into my original signal, just with the high frequency component removed. And in the case of the ECG, uh, this inverse FFT is a really clear signal. So the, uh, the class I used to do this, I call SWH ear, or SW here, depending on how you, how you read it. And its sole purpose is to provide you sort of scientific access to the last several seconds of audio, regardless of when you pull it. Um, and then, I guess that's another issue, is when is it pulled? It's not automatically calculated and processed in the frequency domain as it's recorded. It's only processed as it's being graphed. So the software makes a single graph of the last five seconds of audio with all that frequency stuff, math being done. And then it gives the system about one millisecond to redraw itself, and then it does it again. So even if we were to, I don't know, record at a slower sample rate, it would potentially analyze the data faster than it's being recorded. Um, that's not the way it's actually working here, but it doesn't really matter. The, uh, the point is that the FFT is being made every time it's graphed, every time it's seen. It's not being calculated as it's being recorded. OK, I couldn't help myself. I had to hook up pennies. So right now, these electrodes are pennies. This is a penny that's attached to my body. And it's actually doing a really good job. I'm going to take a picture of it here for the website. I'm going to wait till all the noise is gone. There we go. Um, yeah, so these are just pennies. I'm not even using um, like the conditioner I talked about. And full disclosure, I did lick the penny before putting it on, <laughs> so that helped a little bit. 
But yeah, these are just pennies that I attached to my body with electrical tape. So the um, we call it the muscle simulators are kind of a lateral lateral move. And just like before, I hooked up the pennies, the yellow wires, just straight to the breadboard. So pennies work pretty much just as well.